I'm Charlotte, and I'm a front-end developer at ClearLeft. Um, I am really, really excited to be in Berlin this week. Um, I love... <laughs> yeah. I found that street, that was really cool. Um, I love Beyond Teleran, this has been absolutely incredible, so um, thank you all and thank you, for Mark, uh, thank you to Mark for having me. Um, I live in Brighton, uh, which is on the south coast of England, so I'm right by the beach, um, which is awesome, and that's also where the Clearleft studio is. Um, and before joining Clearleft, I always delivered lots of finished websites um, as collections of pages, right? So like a home page, an about page, a product page, and so on. And it was always with a view that these sites probably wouldn't change again after launch. And so a lot of my class names used to look like these. Uh, things like News Item, News Archive, um, Blue Button. And you can see these class names either contain references to the pages they live on, or their appearance, or their content. They're really specific. Um, my approach to naming things was pretty much just say what you see. And the problem with this approach to naming things is that Components can only really have one purpose, and they probably won't survive the test of time. For example, we've got the class name News Archive here. This works fine if it only ever lives on a news page, but what if that component is needed somewhere else on the page or on a different page, like the contact page, for example? And then, you know, the name News Archive just doesn't really make sense anymore. And so the alternative to reusing overly specific classes is writing new ones. Um, but this results in duplicated code, um, bloated CSS, and unnecessary extra time, which no one enjoys. Mm -hmm. And so a lack of coding conventions and effective communication of these conventions can result in code that is just difficult to read. And then it gets worse as more developers add to it, and then others struggle to understand it. And not only can the code become inconsistent, but not having any coding conventions can make the UI inconsistent as well. And every time new developers make adjustments they might add new styles that don't fit with the content. They might use the wrong typefaces or the wrong colors. And eventually, you can just end up with lots of unnecessary variations of the same components. And this is an extreme case but, um, of button variation, but it's a real one discovered by Brad Frost when he did an interface inventory of a website. And I, I will come back to this a bit later. So, as we've seen, the name given to a component pretty much decides its length of life, so it's important to get it right. And we know that these two components can't exist outside of the news page with these names, but if they were named something like list and card, for example, they would live a much longer and more fruitful life, even if their properties change or they move to a new page. And this is because the names describe what they do and not how they look. So many organizations are turning to some kind of component-based modular design system to help them solve the problems we've just looked at. And speaking of naming things, we haven't quite agreed on a name for these systems yet. Uh, there's currently lots of different terms used to describe them. They pretty much all mean the same thing. And um, there's component libraries, uh, which is one term. Components combined together to create something bigger. It's a term favored by Mark at ClearLeft, who's been building our pattern library tools for a while. Um, there's atomic design, um, which is the naming structure that Brad Frost has given to his pattern library tool called Pattern Lab. It's used and loved by some, less so by others, and it's just a matter of opinion and the project. And again, atoms make up molecules, molecules make up organisms, they're combining to create something bigger. And pattern portfolio is a term used by Natalie Down uh, when she started using the technique at ClearLeft back in 2009. Um, again, you know, a pattern is repeated multiple times, they combine to create something bigger, it's a design, it's a decorative sequence. Front-end style guides is another term that I've heard a lot, and that actually reminds me a bit more of what designers use to communicate language and branding, rather than something for developers as such. For, ex for example, I'd expect to see something like, thou shalt not use the blue logo on a green background, or something like that. Personally, I don't think it matters what you call your system as long as it's appropriate to the project and everyone uses it. So today I'm going to use the term pattern library, um, partly because it's the term I'm most used to using and because I quite like the alliteration in the talk title from Pages to Patterns. So in case you don't already know them, um, pattern libraries document every component of a site with code snippets and notes for their usage. And every component is considered an individual piece which can be reused as many times on a site as needed. So it's a bit like cocktail ingredients. One ingredient can be part of many different concoctions, just like one component of a site can be used on many different pages. 
So it's really important that components are created and named in a way that enables them to become part of so many different mixtures. And a pattern library should facilitate a shared understanding and vocabulary between everyone and the team. Um, everyone should be able to refer to a component and, un and understand what they mean. So Alok um has talked about FutureLearn's pattern library and how it's evolved over time. Their system started out as a one-page style guide listing the most common UI elements, um, but there were several issues with it. Uh, for example, it was only used by one team um, instead of everyone. It fell out of date really quickly. There were no guidelines on how and when to use components and things like that. And there's a great blog post on FutureLearn's website explaining how their new pattern library has addressed so many of these issues. So everything's good. Um, yeah, it's great to see how pattern libraries have addressed lots of issues and around building and maintaining websites. I love seeing how they've evolved and I love working on these kinds of projects. And I love seeing people get excited about them. But a big part of moving your thinking from pages to patterns is tackling this challenge of naming things. And as we all know, naming things is hard. Um, and as we've seen already, a component's name determines its ability to survive the test of time. So we really need to try and get it right. It's even harder to adopt pattern thinking when clients want to sign off page designs before they build their pattern library. As pages make their way through various teams, the managers for sign off, uh, they're discussed. And before you know it, they are known by everyone as the home page and the listing page and the product page and etc. Everyone is talking about pages. And I often find that I build pages and patterns in tandem just to satisfy the various requirements across the project. And I think it can get a little bit confusing. And so the challenges of working with pages and patterns simultaneously uh, were particularly evident in some of our recent projects at ClearLeft, where instead of delivering like completed pattern libraries, we were asked to collaborate with in-house teams to help them build and maintain their own. For example, I was on a project with a team of in-house developers and designers, uh, project manager, product manager, and a few others. And after we spent a few weeks focusing on UX and UI, we asked the team to name and code some components for the first time. And it was just really as an exercise, just to start looking at patterns. And we were working from a product page design with very product-specific content in each component. And so with the first component we picked looked like a card. So everyone named it product card. And it's great that there was a common name suggestion, because that's how our shared language can start to form. But you can see the problem with that name. The product card might become a profile card or a location card one day. And so we continued the exercise with similar results, and it became clear that just taking this full page design and working inwards can actually be quite confusing. And we had a day of really reduced productivity and just frustrations all around, because we just weren't getting past this point of like finding appropriate names for components. So we realized that we kind of needed to come up with a way to help our team just sort of forget about pages and just step away from where we were. So on the journey home that day, I had a train beer with Jeremy at Clear Left and sort of discussed the challenges we've been having. And this is me opening my beer. It turns out the ceilings on Southern Rail trains are actually also bottle openers, um, which is quite useful. It probably wasn't the intention, but it actually works really well. So anyway, I decided that the team would benefit from um, just stepping away from their screens for a bit, just for like a few hours, half a day, whatever, to focus on adopting a new way of thinking and attempting to cha tackle the challenge of naming things. And we decided to use an exercise which I've been calling the pages to patterns exercise. Um, it's been really useful in helping a team consolidate their understanding of component design and, and just help encourage everyone to start building a shared vocabulary together. This exercise is for everybody involved in the pattern library creation. So this includes non-developers and non-designers and literally just anyone with a decision to make in the creation of the pattern library. Um, everyone can take part because no coding is required, unless you want to, of course, which is brilliant, because there is a tiny bit of coding there. Um, and the goal is just to get everyone thinking about patterns at a granular level, removing any context around them. So all you need are some visual designs. Um, this can be anything from like a first cut to a final design. Um, and you need a printer, paper, scissors, and post-it notes. So it's really easy to get started. And part one is all about paper. First of all, we print the designs. 
and then either in a group or individually, we break the interface down into fundamental building blocks by cutting it up. And for this example, I've just used a couple of pages from the BBC website. And once we've cut out components, we mix them up so we don't know where they came from. And then we group similar elements, like buttons, headings, form fields, and things like that. Um, the BBC News website uses a lot of content blocks, like text and image blocks. And at some point, we would need to look closer at these to determine which styles might make up the default component in this group, and then we'd figure out which styles become variations and things like that. But for now, at this stage, we just group them so that we know that they exist. And then we remove duplicates. Um, Duplicates are multiple instances of exactly the same element with exactly the same design. So buttons which look the same but have different colours would all stay because they're variations of one another. And then if we find ourselves with lots of instances of an element with only slight differences between them, we can make a note to review the design just to ensure that we create a nice consistent experience. And this is what I mentioned earlier. Um, Brad Frost uses a technique which he calls an interface inventory um, to analyze the interface of a website. But instead of cutting it up, he actually um, uses screenshots, and then he documents them in a spreadsheet. And when he did this inventory of his bank's website, he found that there was this unhealthy inconsistency of button designs, and this technique just helped him uncover a need for design review. So after part one of the exercise, um, we should be left with something that looks like this. Um, Lots of paper components, they've been grouped, they've been deduped, all laid out. And the design is now in its smallest parts, and we have no idea where these, which pages these components came from, because they're completely independent now. And so in part two, we extend the exercise by generating ideas for component names. Um, so I'm actually going to ask that we have a go at this together if you want to. Um, if, everyone, if anyone has access to a pen and paper, or their phone or something, just to write down something. Um, we'll do that now. Um, so here's a group of components I mentioned earlier, the content block text and images. So I'd, I'd like you all to just write down a name for this kind of component. It doesn't matter about variations, I just want one name. So I'll just give you a few seconds to do that now. Okay, so if you did it, I'll, um, I'll assume that everyone has a name now. Um, it can literally be the first name that you think of. So now compare the name to the people on your left and right, to your neighbours. Have a look at what each other wrote. Okay. So some of you may have written down the same name as the person next to you. And if that's the case, that's a good indication that it's a pretty good name. Did everyone do that? Cool. Um, because you probably have a similar understanding of what this component means. So I'll just explain this step. So step one, the team collectively agree on a component to look at. Um, everyone in the team takes a post-it note and writes down a name for the component. So we keep the name secret until everyone has finished. And then once everyone has thought of a name, we reveal the post-it note, and then we compare and discuss each name. Um, and names which appear multiple times are really good candidates because they indicate a shared language and understanding sort of coming together. And so we repeat this with every component until we have sort of a good number of components named. And in my experience, uh, this part of the exercise has prompted some really good discussions around naming, such as finding class names which bear some meaning to the company and naming methodologies in CSS. I find that this is a really good way to get all of those conversations started. Hmm? Sorry. And uh, naming things doesn't have to be left to developers alone. I found myself in many situations pulling my hair out whilst trying to think of suitable names for components. It can be really hard, um, but actually, you know, um, everyone involved in the project can have a go at this and have the opportunity to contribute, and it can make this task a little bit easier. And so if you're struggling to come up with an appropriate name for a component, asking a designer why they made something look the way it does 
can also help identify its purpose. So involving as many of the team as possible also encourages everyone to adopt pattern thinking and continue to use the language after the exercise. And if this is being carried out at the start of the project, um, it's likely that components will change, their names will evolve and things like that throughout the project, and that's fine because it can, it can be done again. And so part three um, is a final step for those who are comfortable with coding. I won't make us do this one. Um, so what we do is everyone grabs a component each, and then we code up the component in HTML and CSS. And sometimes I find it's good to set a time limit to resist the temptation to perfect the appearances because actually the purpose of this exercise is to just try things out. There's, the code usually gets thrown away. It doesn't often get kept anyway. And then once we have some coded components, um, we compare and we discuss the code. Um, and in particular, we might look at how the class names have been written, and then we repeat it for each component. And this example uses the BEM methodology. Um, if CSS methodologies have been discussed, this is a really good time to test them out. And at this point, we can test as many variations of like, vocabularies and methodologies as we like. Because if it doesn't work, we can just drop it without investing any actual code in the pattern library. And so this whole exercise can be repeated again um, to identify larger components. Some of these will contain elements from the first round of the exercise, and so if that's the case, we can check that they make sense and stand alone in different contexts. And actually, a common challenge is knowing how granular to go with this. Um, how small should a component be? Um, how many pieces can form one component? Um, what even is a component? I don't have the answer to this. Um, but in my experience so far, it has varied across projects, and different teams have had different reasons for their choices. So one of the great things about this exercise is that it can be valuable at different stages of a project. So it's valuable at the start, um, when the team are just getting used to working with patterns, or when the design has evolved and the team are focusing on naming and coding. Um, the exercise can be carried out really quickly. It can be repeated as often as required. And that's the beauty of paper prototyping, isn't it? It's the low cost of change. You can throw it away and do it again. So Natalie Down um, used to carry out a similar exercise of prototyping at Clearleft. She used pens and paper to build components and demonstrate their functionality and size. And then this enabled her to see how they might work and fit together before investing any time in the, in the code. I believe Hayden has done a similar thing um, at Neon Tribe where he prototyped interfaces out of things like card and marker pens and blue tack and tape. And what I really like is that he also took pens and scissors and tape and everything into the session so that he could rebuild prototypes on the fly. So what happens next? Um, what do we do after we've done this exercise? Well, it kind of depends on the goals of the exercise. There are loads of ways to take this forward. Um, we can make it part of everyday culture. I find it really useful to stick patterns and their names onto a large piece of paper and just fix it to the wall for everyone to see. Um, as designs change, the patterns can be reprinted, they can be discussed and replaced, and it actually serves as a really nice reminder of the components, and it should provoke discussions as the project progresses. Dan Moore has talked about how he uses a Google Docs spreadsheet to compile components so that other people in the team can actually discuss them in a document, and obviously this works better for teams who can't co-locate and can't see the same wall. Alec Olmatova at FutureLearn makes it, uh, takes it even further by putting components in front of users of the website so that they can like, move them around and see where they would put them. I really like this idea. Involving users as much as possible is really important. So to encourage this shared understanding and language, it's important to make sure that everyone involved in the pattern library's creation and decision making is familiar with it. People get busy, so the people who are heavily involved in the creation, like the designers and the developers, uh, should make sure it's shared with the rest of the team from an early stage and regularly. And once the language is forming, you can develop it further. Language can be used to make visual connections as well. So I mentioned earlier that asking why a designer made a component look the way it does can help you understand its purpose and function, which can then help you find an appropriate name for it. 
I really like how um, Tom Osborne has used the metaphor visual loudness to help link the function and appearance of components. In this case, the more prominent a component is, the more loud it is on this scale. So, and this is just a scale created by Tom. So something very prominent like a buy now button needs to be right at the top of the loudness spectrum. So he, he would use the term scream on this to describe it. And then you have links with ha which have really little prominence, um, and they're described as whistle and whisper. And so if possible, try to use a vocabulary which means something to the organization. People are more likely to remember and form connections with terms they know and are familiar with. For example, an e-commerce site for a company like ASOS, who largely sell clothes, might, use, might decide to use a clothes sizing vocabulary for a particular component and its variations. So skirts and dresses come in different lengths, described as mini, midi, and maxi. Mini is the shortest, midi is in the middle, and maxi is the longest. Um, and it could be that these three variations of clothes describe three variations of a component really well. And I built a pattern library for a bike register last year. Um, they offer a bike security registration scheme. So we made use of bike parts for class names on the website. And these are just a couple of examples that I, that I pulled out. And uh, you've got like pump, which is to do with adding padding. And then there's a whole load of classes in the frame group, which is for grids. Um, and the client really seemed to enjoy it. They, yeah, they found it really useful. And the, the developers enjoyed implementing it and things like that it related to their products. And they were all using it. And so once a language starts forming, everyone should make an effort to refer to components by the names they've agreed on. This strengthens the system, it, the communication, and the shared understanding. And I'm a developer, and I know that it's really tempting to dive straight into code, and sometimes that is definitely the right way. But um, I think there's a lot to be gained from just getting away from the screen sometimes and just focusing on the right thinking and the right language and the right approach first. After all, that's what we're doing here today, aren't we? We're at this conference, we're sharing our experiences, and we're thinking, and we're getting away from our screens. And I think these kind of activities might also seem like a lot of extra time, which they could be, but in many cases, it can reduce the chances of discovering that you need to change course later on, and so ultimately, you could actually save time as well. And so in this exercise, we just to sort of recap, we identify components, we begin to name them, and we start to think about code. Um, the key benefits are that it creates the same starting point for everyone in the team, it encourages shared language, and it encourages pattern thinking across the team. So I've used this exercise to kick off loads of different pattern library projects now. And it's also a lot of fun. I mean, who doesn't enjoy messing around with paper and scissors, right? Thank you. <laughs> Early, sorry. <laughs>